So we've left the uh, the medieval walled city of Avignon and we've driven across the river, the Rhone, and we've come over here to, I think it's called the Chartreuse. It was a monastery, an ancient monastery, and uh, Lorraine has another piece of her past life that we think is in this in this place so do you want to <laughs> yeah well I'm just feeling very very um, feeling very wobbly right now because uh, this may well be I'm not sure well, obviously <laughs> very emotional uh, but from the past life memory that I had obviously I have a, a recollection of, of what the place looked like and so that this is one of the big tests to go in there and see if it matches with my recollection, the, the, the things that I saw. Because I know that there was a, a, a garden space, there was a paved courtyard. And uh, yeah, we're just gonna have to wait and see. From the pictures, we've seen a few courtyards. It looks quite cloistered. Apparently it's now an artist's residence. So even if it's not the place, it will sound quite fun to visit. Anyway. And the town anyway, yeah. is absolutely, it's so beautiful. Yeah. So it's gonna be amazing anyway, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll let you know. I feel, I feel all sorts of churnings in the pit of my stomach. So I think this may well be the place. It's from the outside, it's very formidable. It's like a big fortress on the like built into the rock into the into the hill isn't it yeah. so and we had to drive up all these really cool winding streets to get here so yeah. we shall update you so it turns out we're not actually at the monastery our uh, GPS, as usual, and our guide teams have decided that we're here at the, uh, what is it, Saint Fort Saint Andre. Saint Andre Fort. And as soon as we walk in, where our stomachs are flipping over, <laughs> like, oh, something's going on here. And, uh, you know, Laurie's just discovered that it was actually, you know, the, you tell the, what you just yeah, <laughs> I can't speak. <laughs> So <laughs> around the time, I mean earlier than uh, the, the period of time, because I think this was around sort of late 1300s, but then actually around exact, the exact time that we're talking about, the 1500s. So there were two different centres, they were in opposition. So this, uh, well, centre uh, and the bishops and the, the, the abbots were in competition with those on the other side of the Rhone because they were all trying to be the ones that had the seat of power and it wasn't all part of France. The other side was uh, Provencal, Provencal and this was, mm. this was still France. And so they would have been battling with one another over supremacy and power. And this place was also used as a prison. So there would have been, and there's, apparently there are markings, there's graffiti. This place is known for the fact that people have left symbols and messages carved into the rocks. So I have a very distinct feeling that at some point I was here, I can feel it, I think that's what the emotions are because it feels very closely connected, but this isn't actually the site that we're looking for, yeah. but obviously we, I think we, obviously we're meant to be we here. had to come here first, yeah. and so there's, there's one area is the fort, and then mm. we're going to go in in a minute to the actual site of the, the abbey, and mm. the abbey house, and the abbey gardens, which I suspect will be a bit of a mirror of what we're going to find when we get to um, Chartreuse, which Chartreuse. is... And it's interesting because the whole time we've been here, I've kind of had this feeling, oh, I didn't have a past life here in Avignon. This is where we're exploring Laurie's past life. And uh, right. this is the first place really here that we've been to that I've felt yeah. a really strong connection to. And I haven't had any visuals yet, but I've got my pendulum out and checked. <laughs> and there's, yes, I have a feeling I was a woman. It might be something witchy or inquisition-y going on here. I'm not sure, yeah. but I feel very like... Yeah, and one of the yucky. towers, there, there are two towers here mm. in this fort, and one of them is actually, um, what was the name of it? The name of it the was Mask Tower. The Mask Tower, which takes its name from the Provencal Masco, meaning witch or magician, mm. 
because it was reputed to attract the wicked spells so that the rest of the battlements were protected. So they clearly believed in magic here and they were clearly, I think the symbols were not just graffiti. I think that those symbols would have been spells. It would have been energy yeah. that they were putting into the stones. Protection, and yeah. the stonemason's marks and different guilds have left their marks. So I think that they were using energy magic back at that point. Back at that point, already in the, when we go, where you go in to buy your tickets in the bookshop, I've seen kind of one of my precious wisdom symbols, yeah. which is based on sacred geometry and they're selling whole books on the golden section and sacred geometry in yeah. there. So we know, again, it's a sign. There's, there's, there's more to it than just symbols. It, they're magical charms. So we're gonna go explore further. What's under there is the question. But again, it's just more evidence that in all of these buildings in this area, they have underground chambers that are covered in white paving slabs. Yeah. Everywhere we've gone. Like a dumb thing, isn't it? How many secret? How many secrets are hidden in this whole place? So we've just arrived at the Tower of the Masks and we're about to head up. We can already feel the energy in here, it's really a bit stagnant and yeah. a bit heavy and yeah, I don't know what's been kind of encoded into the walls here but I think we've got some undoing to do. Yeah, I'm having it kind of, well like in different, various different places while we've been here I've had kind of intense pain in the womb area. So there's a lot of um, repression of the truth and, and the divine feminine obviously going on here and obviously it was all all this region was connected to the heresy and the Albigensians and everything wasn't it so yeah, yeah we'll see what we uncover Climbing up to the top of the Tower of the Masks, there's Laurie behind me, and uh, it's just gone 11 11. And we've just done a big clearing of like symbol magic, trap souls, all sorts of magic. Magic was used here because we weren't allowed to enter. There was a big booming voice that I heard that said, Who dare enter here? So I was like, Not going up till we clear it. to the top and up. I got this impression of a woman in the corner rocking, so I think we're going to have to do a bit of clearing in here. Yeah, yeah. There was another one downstairs that was a really similar size, and mm -hmm. I think it was the same. But I do wonder that uh, I think they were one for men and one for women, because yeah. they would have separated them. They wouldn't have allowed them to be together. Yeah. So I have a feeling this was there. A feeling that children were taken from people as well. I had a really strong impression of that as we walked in, of being a woman and having my baby taken from me and separated and. But I'm sure also the younger children would probably have been put to work yeah. inside the abbot or yeah. inside the um, inside the fortress. Yeah. The and probably re-educated and 
Got so many symbols here. Oh my god, so many. So we've just come up and found lorry carved into the first thing I see as we come up. <laughs> Might be nothing, might be coincidence, but we have been finding signposts every step along the way of this journey, so it does feel like it's relevant. Mm, massively. <laughs> So I've just come down out of the St. Andres Fortress, St. Andre Fortress, uh, which I'm in a much nicer place now. I'm now in the grounds of the Abbey and the beautiful gardens of the Abbey and uh, it's much nicer. <laughs> uh, I had a really, really strong past life memory surface while we were in the fortress, while we were up in the Tower of the Masks and it was of being a woman, a woman with a husband and a small baby and my husband had been a dignitary who, from the Provencal region who was coming over to the French side to deliver some documents to, to negotiate on peace terms, terms for peace. And uh, they knew that he was coming, he had the documents. And so the, the, the people on the French side, on this side of the river, sent uh, soldiers to come and take me and the baby and bring us to this fortress and uh, subsequently I won't go into details of the horrific things that were done in this past life memory to me and uh, said child, but when the husband arrived to negotiate these peace terms, they then had us to bargain with and subsequently had my throat cut and the child thrown over the ramparts of the, uh, of the fortress because the husband refused flat out point blank to uh, give them the information that they wanted and they they wanted information about I guess names of people that they would need to murder in order to gain power over that side of the river they wanted him to be I guess like a spy for them and he refused so they then had me killed and had the child killed and but set him free and sent him back to the Provencal side wifeless childless uh, and they tore up the uh, the peace negotiation they tore up the, the the document that he had delivered and basically said no nope, and take this message back to your uh, your leaders and uh, he ended up hanging himself it was quite a, a brutal horrible time and a very vivid past life memory and not something that you could actually make up so I've had to do a lot of clearing here we also had to clear a lot of trapped souls in the tower um, I mean these past life memories are just surfacing like ordinary everyday memories the further we go into our spiritual work into our spiritual journey the further I have access to the Akashic record and my, I open and clear my channel it's like clearing karma both for myself and for the collective so happy to have uh, released some of that energy from this place Thank you. 
So we just arrived in Villeneuve and we are now heading up to the monastery. And uh, as all of the places, it's very, very beautiful. But we're just not entirely sure what we're going to find when we get up to the top. When we get there. We've, uh, again, well, we've had a theme on this trip of every time, like it started the first day we arrived in Marseille and we were looking for a parking space and we found an indoor car park and it said open. We parked the car, we walked out and it had closed. And I was like, oh, we must have just got in there. And everywhere we've been, as soon as we've gone and done what we needed to do, the place has closed directly after we've Absolutely. walked out. So there's this message about all these old doors closing and I guess like we keep getting a message like that it's about full circle coming full circle and moving on to new things and new doors opening so it's almost like we're kind of clearing up any I guess unresolved karma or whatever it is personally but also collectively yeah and uh, old doors are closing it's a new dawn it's a new day yeah and literally we are we are getting into places by the skin of our teeth, literally, by yeah. the last, and it keeps happening. We just arrived just at the very last minute when we we're supposed to be there. Oh, even the checking into our, our um, apartment, we, had to, we were coming back from St. Marie de la Mer, we were driving, Laurie's driving like a maniac trying to get there on time. We got there with like a minute to spare, I said to the man. Actually, it was 30 seconds. Like literally, we had to be there by 7 p.m. to check in, and I said to the guy, oh, we were, we were hoping to make it, and he went, you literally just made it, basically, and we would have had to find alternative accommodation and it was prepaid so it would have cost us a mu double so we also just now had um, a walk through a little market and got some lunch and then as soon as we finished at the market and sat down to get a drink in the cafe the market started closing up and finished so it just shut down so it's amazing evidence again so we'll head up to the uh, chartreuse to the old monastery and see what we uncover there So we've just entered into Le Chartreux and uh, yeah, <laughs> just feeling very emotional, very sick. Uh, I need to look for a place where things were put under the ground. So <laughs> I don't know. I don't know where I'm gonna where I'm gonna find it. But we'll know the spot when we get I'll there. Know it when I get yeah. there. I remember the abbot coming running down, I remember him coming running down some steps and we were all in a, I don't know whether it was in, more of an inside. Like an enclosed courtyard. So, um, this feels like the scene where we were attacked. What's through there? I don't know. I'm, I mean, I'm very conscious that that thing there looks completely different. Doesn't it? The other stone. It does look like, yeah, it's a square look. That looks like it's been enclosed. But I'm not sure the place where the tomb, where the, where the underground chamber and where the actual, where I remember the soldiers coming in because they probably would have come in through a gate. And we'd all congregated waiting for the abbot or the prior to come in. He came running down some steps with some of the soldiers, but they they didn't wait. They just, they, they just cut off his head. One of them cut off his head with a sword. And then the rest of us just die. We're killed. Yeah, look. These were definitely... They look like later. underground chambers, don't they? That's definitely... Something's been sealed in. Look, that's the shape of a cross. Yeah, but that's also a completely different stone. Different it stone. is, yeah. There's definitely something underneath that. Um, but, um, <laughs> uh, flagstones and... That's clearly the yeah, look where the, that would have been a ring to pull it up. I used to 
We used to hide the uh, manuscript and um, script, the scrolls down my jer jerkin thing that I used to wear, and I would cut, I would sneak out here. I think I would sit in the trees and read when no one was looking. And they didn't know that I could read Latin and that I could read all the different languages. I think I'd taught myself many languages, but pretended that I was stupid, pretended that I couldn't read at all so that I could get access to stuff. So that even if I got caught with it, I just pretended I was looking at the pictures. And that way they let me, they let me work with all of the really important documents and all of the really important pieces. So when my friend went into his past life, he described the entrance to it as being yeah. like a big iron door, big heavy door that he went through. <laughs> With the, uh, it's still there. <laughs> which <laughs> looks exactly like that, the description that he gave of it. Which it was probably an older door back in the day. I'm sure it was, still. but it's... Why do they need it there? What's behind it? So, the original... the bolts on it. And notice that the bolts are on the outside. So the bolts were locked in at night time. No night time escapades for the dudes in here. Oh look at that wall. Hidey hole. <laughs> so I've just, I've just, we've just come out after looking at the um, chartreuse, and uh, I've been wandering around this beautiful courtyard, courtyard behind us, which is um, the cloister of Saint John. Yeah, which is one of the oldest parts of the whole place. And I've run, run into Laurie chatting to one of the guys that work here, and uh, he was just talking about a myth of treasure, the myth of the treasure, which many archaeologists and researchers have been looking for for many years and they keep saying that it doesn't exist, that it's not real or that it was merely the instruments that they used for mass, so the chalices and the cups and the, mm. the things that would have been uh, part of the mass ceremony but there is no smoke without fire ever and so I think that the treasure that they were looking for, I think it was the books, I think it was the stuff that uh, my yeah. friend had talked about in his past life information that was buried, books yeah. that had been yeah. buried and there was knowledge that he described in the past life that would have shattered the beliefs that people had and it was about the early history of not just the church but Jesus and his family life and <laughs> we've just found another picture, another painting in the fresco chapel of a very, very pregnant Mary Magdalene. Looking very pregnant she very was. Pregnant. And even some questionable, um, as we've gone around, some of these statues apparently of yeah. Mother Mary or the Virgin Mary with baby Jesus, I think are actually Mary Magdalene with her children. Yeah. That you can you can see the distinction. Mary Magdalene's always portrayed with very, very long hair, you know, di little subtle differences, the, yeah. the picture of the rose. Um, the other thing about the treasure too, and they say they, were, they found you know, parts used for building the church, like the copes and things, but I'm wondering if there was symbolism hidden in that, that that might have been part of the treasure, that there were secrets kind of encoded in it. As we know, you know they encode symbols, they, this is for John the Baptist, yeah. you, you can see symbolism everywhere. So, And yet again, we've seen in some of the rooms that there were uh, false floor tiles or false floor so many the whole uh, place like stones and underneath that they would have buried stuff so mm -hmm. the fact that if they had very important uh, information and documents and scrolls here i think that it would be almost ridiculous to assume or to, to think that they wouldn't have had something like that here so that if there was an emergency mm -hmm. that they would be able to keep stuff hidden in a safe mm -hmm. place in a safe vault that would have been 
unable to be seen unless you knew it was there. And so, yeah, things being hidden under the floor. So maybe in the part, when we were doing the exploration of the past life, he did say that the, the stuff had been found mm. and that these books and documents were actually now held in the Vatican. That some of them were in the Louvre. Maybe some of them were in, still in the, maybe even in the museum here. But it's as if the Vatican's going to reveal what they have in exactly, their vault. Exactly, they're never going to reveal. It's why it's that in a vault. Anyway. It's, mm. it's it's stashed away to preserve or keep them safe, really, because mm. I think that the information that was in there would rock the very foundation yeah. of the religion as we know it. So they can't reveal it, really. It would be far too dangerous. But we are going to keep searching. Yeah, and we <laughs> are going to be revealing truth. it as we find it. The truth it. is out there. <laughs> Not yet sure if we found the exact location of uh, the, the tomb itself, but we certainly located the energy. And having found the cells where we would have been residing, I became very aware of the soul fragment, if you like, of my friend that was here and potentially part of me that was still here, had refused to leave because he was still here. And in tuning in found that there was a big contract that was linked to sacrifice and the sacrifice was connected to sacrificing for others, sacrificing for the greater good and sacrificing for knowledge. And that was part of this whole journey here that he had given up his life to take care of the sacred books and manuscripts and I'd helped him to do that and the work was completed the job had been fully fully and very thoroughly uh, thoroughly done so we were able to complete the contract end it and release him and the new contract gave us permission to experience freedom love and access to knowledge ancient and new and to be able to share that knowledge so having arrived in the chartreuse again uh, i'm here sort of following lorraine around filming her thinking oh this is her gig i'll just hold space so that she can do whatever clearing she needs to do and uh, we wandered into one of the first courtyards it was this beautiful place uh, with a beautiful tree in the middle and i just felt compelled to sit down and meditate in that space so i sat down and i was just doing my little precious wisdom uh, attunement that I do which sort of opens a, a divine portal in a space and immediately I had a vision of Pope Innocent VI coming forward with a huge scroll of names a big document um, and it was it, it was like a list of names and all the bloodlines of um, anyone who had been charged with heresy uh, and it felt very like damning like the, this fam these families those these are the ones that are that are the heretics and and it was like this document had carried forward through the ages through the bloodlines and i got the distinct impression that he was asking for help and that a part of his soul was actually trapped in this place this had been built by him and his original tomb was here apparently and the feeling was help me please clear this please clear this so that i can go home please forgive me so i had to release all these charges of um, heresy from all of these souls and through all the bloodlines it was basically as, mu as much as i could from the collective and then release that part of his soul energy and i got my pendulum out afterwards and i did check And then Lorraine and I were wandering around the, the cloisters and again found this tiny little place and we walked past it, both of us felt compelled to peek behind the curtain and then came back down and got the distinct impression that there was someone trapped there. I could see a monk kneeling and praying and I kept getting the word penance and penitent and so both of us separately tuned in and as Lorraine was getting all, uh, all the contracts that she had to clear, I, and again I got a really distinct impression that it was Laurie's friend. Ooh. Hello, Mr. Wasp. <laughs> that had been the monk that we were seeing, that there was an aspect of his soul that was trapped there that we had to release. So I had to clear all the, uh, all the contracts of penance and uh, the need to be penitent in order to reach heaven or succeed or whatever it was. So we cleared that 
and then I was asked to open a huge uh, pillar of light and there were many many of these monks that sort of then started coming forward and it was like we opened this pillar this portal over the whole space to clear uh, all the uh, the monks that had taken on those vows that, to let them leave you you've done it now you've been penitent your penance is received you are forgiven you may go so hopefully this place has had a good old like clear out uh, the final thing that uh, that we did that was quite poignant was that there's a there's an art installation here so parts of it were there were art on the walls and things like this and we went into this behind this black curtain into one of the cells and it was pitch black in this room and a tiny point of light uh, to the point where Lorraine went in and went oh there's a bench I couldn't see a damn thing so she's like guiding me over here over here over here so we sit down and we're waiting and it just says please wait eventually a, a, a water droplet will drop from the ceiling but we're watching the floor and there's a circular light from this tiny light on the floor which was changing shape and we're kind of scrying in it I could see faces and Laurie said she could see the earth and it felt very poignant. I always say that doing shadow work, when you become aware of your shadow self and you heal it and you integrate it, it's like walking into a dark room and turning on a light and then suddenly you're aware of what's in the room. And in this particular room, as soon as we sat down, it was like the dark closed in, everything just went black and went really close. And I couldn't see whether there was anything behind us on this bench we were sitting on. I thought there was loads of space behind us, but I immediately felt this dark figure sort of looming behind me. And I grabbed Lorraine, I was like, oh my God, there's someone behind me. And immediately started asking for light, asking for light. And then the two of us could suddenly see in the dark. The li it was like, the, the light didn't change, but our eyes just suddenly adjusted and we could see the light and the water dripped from the ceiling, kind of like the moment we asked for the light. And it felt very symbolic of what we'd done here, of the work that we'd done here, that we came to bring light and to release the shadow and to release the darkness, uh, to be aware of the, uh, the truth being suppressed, the things that are hidden, um, bringing them to light and allowing people to know the truth of really what what went on with the true religion, the true word of Christ, the true story, which of course goes all the way back to ancient Egypt and was a story of love, not penitence, not sin, not suppression, and certainly not the repression of women, so, or anyone else for that matter. So anyway, I think that about covers it. <laughs>